Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Ask a Property Manager. This is episode number 92 and today is October 13th, 2021. We're coming to you from Studio 2.0 here at Own Buffalo. I'm Andrew Schultz, Principal Broker of Own Buffalo Inc. And on today's show, we're gonna be talking about lease renewals, what to do when a brand new tenant comes to you and says that they can't pay the rent. We're gonna answer some questions from housing providers around the country and so much more. Before we jump into that, we are gonna go ahead and plug our social media. New episodes of Ask a Property Manager drop every Wednesday, 10 a.m. Eastern. You can catch those on our Facebook page as well as on our YouTube page. The replays go up the same day as well on both platforms. Don't forget about our Instagram. We post content there that doesn't make it to the Facebook page as well as the YouTube page. And last but not least, don't forget about the Rent Prep for Landlords podcast. Uh, current episode of the Rent Prep for Landlords podcast is taking a look at what to do when a contractor underperforms on a job, um, what you should do when a tenant wants to give you a year's worth of rent money up front, and renting an apartment to a company so that they can use it to house employees. So don't miss out on that episode. Uh, new episodes of the Rent Prep for Landlords podcast drop every other Thursday morning anywhere podcasts are heard or over at rentprep.com slash podcast. We're gonna go ahead and jump into our news of the day here, starting with this article from CNBC. Excuse me. But this is an interesting one because it takes the opposite stance of what we've been talking about for months now. Today's tight housing market is already overbuilt, one analyst says. And this is in comparison to everybody out there and all of the uh, the housing contractors, the housing developers who are saying that we are way under where we need to be in terms of housing starts. Um, this is an article basically stating that the housing market's already overbuilt. So let's jump in here. Uh, anyone out house hunting right now knows the pickings are slim, the competition is fierce, and the prices are high. But one analyst said that there are actually too many houses being built. The supply of homes for sale at the end of August totaled 1.29 million units, down for down 1.5% from July and down 13.4% from August of 2020, according to the National Association of Realtors. That represents a 2.6 month supply at the current sales pace, which is one of the lowest supplies on record. A six month supply is considered a balanced market between buyer and seller. One analyst, Dennis McGill, director of research at Zellman and Associates, however, said that the current supply of homes for sale is not indicative of the overall need to build more houses. Demand is strong right now, he said, because of an unusual emotional surge driven by the pandemic. Demographics, which are a better measure of housing demand historically, do not support more construction. There's a downward trajectory of population growth, household formation as well, that's really going to undermine the need for what's built, said McGill. On the other side of that, you have the development community that's actually very optimistic about there being a housing shortage and actually very optimistic about how much needs to be built, and they're actually pressing the accelerator harder than we, we think that they probably should be. McGill cited data from the latest decennial uh, census from the U.S. Census Bureau showing household formation is about 24% uh, below where it was in the prior four decades. Just to clarify before we move forward, housing for me, household formation is when um, a couple moves in together and they rent their first home or buy their first home, um, or when a family decides to have a multi-generational home and they all move in together, that would be considered a housing formation, a household formation for, for purposes of the census. McGill's partner, Ivy Zellman, who perhaps is best known for one of the first warnings about the subprime mortgage crisis over a decade ago, agreed. The market is too hot. There's just a massive amount of capital that's coming to the space, Zellman said, referring to the investor interest in the housing market. We actually believe the industry is already overbuilding in single family uh, to normalize demand by roughly 20% and about 10% for multifamily, so we couldn't be on more of an opposite side of where the market and where the industry is, frankly. Home builders, however, seem to disagree. Housing starts are still not where they were over a decade ago, but they are slowly crawling back, and home builder sentiment is high. The, nation of the, the stocks of the nation's public home builders have also been on a tear, although that is largely due to pandemic demand. I've seen Ivy's thesis, and I do agree population growth is slowing, and, that, and that's a reason why the old normal combined single family and multifamily construction of 1.8 start, million starts per year is too high, said Rob Dietz, chief economist with the National Association of Home Builders. Uh, Dietz did not agree that the industry is overbuilding, however. We need 800 to 900 single family homes for household formation growth 
and another 200 to 300 per year for replacement housing and second homes, he said. He pointed to a two, he's pointed to 2018 as a more instructive year for the true housing market conditions. That was the last period of rising mortgage interest rates, and it did produce what he calls a housing soft patch. The challenge now is that we have the supply side limitations, including lack of building materials and a growing shortage of skilled workers, plus higher home prices relative to incomes. If the market is actually already overbuilt, that would present even bigger problems for home prices, which are, all, which are most definitely overheated. Most expect price gains to shrink as interest rates rise, but if there's a glut of homes for sale in the next decade, prices could be in for a larger fall. The one real wild card is the very hot single family rental market, which is being fueled by new investor demand. Should rental demand fall and those same investors decide to sell and cash out, supply would, secure, supply would surely outpace demand and the tight and pricey market we now see we see now would flip to the opposite. You have home builders who bring supply. You now have single family rental companies who are bringing a lot of supply built for rent. And you have multifamily developers bringing supply. So all three of those pieces have seen a very big step up in optimism on the development side. And it is going to take some time for that to come to market, said McGill. But it's going to be coming pretty aggressively. So this is an interesting article. It basically takes the exact opposite stance of the stance that we've heard time and time again from so many developers, uh, even, even from NAR, from National Association of Builders, from the National Association of Home Builders. Everybody has been saying we need more housing. That's been the, the, the drum that everyone's been beating for year, the last couple of years at least. Uh, and here we go, now we have an analyst coming out and saying maybe we're already overbuilt and we just don't realize it yet. And I suppose that it is possible. It's one of those situations where if you are in an overbuilt scenario, the chances of it being recognized, it takes time for these things to, to play out in the market and to be recognized. So perhaps we are overbuilt. I don't think that we are based on what I'm seeing, based on the fact that the market is still as competitive as it is. And I would say it's softening a little bit here in Western New York, but it's still a very competitive market. And I do think that we're probably underbuilt for housing, at least in uh, at least in some markets around the country. Whether or not Buffalo is one of those markets is anybody's guess, uh, but it'll be interesting to see how this plays out over the course of time, especially with mortgage rates starting to tick up. Next article comes to us from The Real Deal, and this one is on Tesla. Tesla's moving its headquarters from Silicon Valley to Austin. Uh, Tesla's relocating its headquarters from Austin to Austin, Texas from Silicon Valley, and the tech world's latest latest major shift to the Lone Star State. CEO Elon Musk revealed the decision during a shareholder meeting at Tesla's factory just outside the Texas capital, saying the company was contending with a limit to how big you can scale in the Bay Area. He cited lack of affordable housing and long commutes for those based in the Bay Area, echoing rationales cited by other companies that have moved operations away from one of the most expensive metros in the country. The company is currently headquartered in Palo Alto and established its first factory in Fremont. Musk likened the factory's growth from a kid in their parent's shoes to spam in a can. He said the company was expanding, not abandoning its presence in the state. It continuing to expand Fremont operations, Tesla hopes to increase Fremont output by 50%, he said. Tesla's move will put the company's headquarters closer to the base of SpaceX, another of his companies, and where he lives. It's not immediately clear how many employees will be affected by the company's relocation. Texas Governor Greg Abbott, who lauded the state's lower taxes and smaller regulations for attracting companies, tweeted to welcome the company to the land of opportunity and innovation. In moving the headquarters out of California, Musk is also making good on a threat he made earlier in the pandemic when he expressed frustration about health protocols that forced a pause in production at Fremont. Tesla announced in July 2020 that the company's plans to build a factory in Travis County right, out of, right outside of Austin for $1.1 billion. The Austin American Statesman reported it would be one of the largest economic development projects in the state's history at that time, planned for 2,100 acres. Tesla isn't the first company to relocate from California to Texas during the pandemic. Oracle and Hewitt Packard last year announced they were reloading, reloading headquarters to the state as well. So it's interesting to see more and more companies making that move from California to Texas or California to any other state, really. And we are starting to see more and more companies making that move from areas where it's become high cost of living. I mean, come on, Silicon Valley is probably one of the highest cost of living areas in the country. Um, Austin is starting to move up, though. Like when you move tech entrepreneurs and tech employees from 
a tech hub to an area that is lower cost of living, they're going to spend more money. And the cost of things, especially housing, is going to start climbing up as people realize, hey, there's tech jobs here now that are paying the big bucks. Our housing prices are going to go up as a result of that. So that's interesting to see. I remember him mentioning that he wanted to pull out of uh, California during the pandemic because of the restrictions. And it's interesting to see him making good on that promise to pull his uh, to pull his headquarters out of California and to move it to Austin, Texas. So be interesting to see how this pans out over time. I guess we'll just have to watch and uh, keep track of that one. So a little bit of something different for humor this week. This is actually, uh, it's a Facebook post that someone literally stole a, a house. Uh, let's read into this here. The Harrisonburg Police Department is currently investigating the theft of a modular home from Clayton Homes located in the 3800 block of South Main Street. On October 3rd, 2021 at approximately 7 a.m., an unknown offender connected a truck to a 14 by 60 foot modular, uh, modular home equipped for transport and drove off the property. The offender's vehicle was last seen pulling the modular home southbound on Route 11. The suspect vehicle is described as a white four-door flatbed truck with amber-colored running lights above the cab. The stolen modular home is described as having clay-colored vinyl siding with white trim and black shingles. HPD is asking for assistance from the public in identifying the owner of the subject vehicle and the whereabouts of the modular home. Dude literally stole a house. Here's the first update. Suspect vehicle has been identified as a white four-door Dodge Ram 3500 or 4500 flatbed truck with amber running lights above the cab. Um, on October 3rd, between 9 and 10 a.m., the truck was seen south of Lynchburg in Campbell County at the intersection of Route 105 and Long Island Road. The truck attempted to turn from Route 105 onto Long Island Road before backing up and continuing south on Route 501. Uh, if you were witness to this crime or have any more information, call us, blah, blah, blah. Dude can't even drive his house around. <laughs> update, final update. Modular home has been located on a remote property in Halifax County along with a stolen skid steer. HPD thanks the public, the Halifax County Sheriff's Office, and the Campbell County Sheriff's Office for their assistance. Additional updates are provided as this is still an ongoing investigation. That's crazy. Could you imagine stealing an entire house? Literally stole an entire house. Literally stole an entire house. That's crazy. Like, I just can't even wrap my mind around that one. That's pretty impressive. Uh, one other little humorous thing to share with you guys here today. I saw this and it made me laugh because I honestly do the exact same thing every time I drive by a house that I sold and I have somebody in the car. I have to point at the house and be like, yeah, I sold that. So, you know, it's no different in the flipping world versus the sales world. All right, let's go ahead and get into our questions from housing providers around the country here. Uh, we'll start with this one on offering lease renewals to tenants. Our current fixed lease with the tenant is ending on November 30th. The tenant's been running from us for the past two and a half years without any issues so far. I sent an email on October 8th to check their intentions on renewal and ask them to respond by October 11th. I haven't received a response by today, which is October 12th. He's always prompt in responding. Once he responds, we'll send the lease renewal addendum for signatures. Please advise. So my only advice here is to plan for more time on lease renewals. Texting someone and giving them four days to decide what they're going to do whether or not they want to stay in a home for another year or not is simply not enough time. Um, it's a bit ridiculous, to be honest with you. You got to give somebody more than four days to make up a decision like that. So here in the state of New York, there's actually time frames involved. Um, so if a tenant has lived in a property for a year or less, um, you have to give them 30 days notice. Um, and this is if you're terminating the lease, but you'll understand why I'm bringing this up in a second. So under a year is 30 days notice, one to two years is 60 days notice, and two plus years is 90 days notice that you have to give for terminating a lease. And for that reason, we start checking on lease renewals at the 120 day mark. We're looking 120 days out from now to see what leases are coming up for renewal and to start working with those tenants to find out if they're planning on staying or if they're planning on going so that we know that we're remaining in compliance with everything that we need to from New York State's perspective. If a tenant tells us that they're not planning on renewing, we will issue a lease termination notice on our end just so it's clear that the lease is not being renewed and we send them their move out instructions at the same time. So my recommendation here is to figure out uh, first and foremost before contacting the tenant if there's going to be a change in rent for the upcoming lease term. Figure that out, iron that out before you contact the tenant um, because you're going to want to communicate that 
to the tenant when you ask them if they're planning on staying. Don't wait until they say, yeah, I'm going to stay to say, oh, by the way, the rent's going up by $100 a month or something like that. Communicate with them early and communicate with them often so that you understand what's going on. Uh, the tenant understands what's going on and everybody stays on the same page as to what you're planning on doing with regards to renewing that lease or not renewing that lease. Don't wait to start talking to a tenant until the last minute. And you still have some time here. I mean, I don't know what the laws are in your state. If you were in New York state, I can tell you, you're definitely at two and a half years of tenancy. You should have started this process a little bit sooner. Um, different states have different laws. Check your laws so that you understand what's going on in your state specifically. Um, but we basically have moved our lease renewal period to back to that 120 day period um, simply because that way we're always in compliance with the 30, 60, 90 that we would have to give a tenant in the state of New York if we decide we don't want to renew a lease or something along those lines. Moving on to our next question. Brand new tenant can't pay rent. Now what? Uh, I have a tenant that just signed a new one-year lease. One month and nine days into the lease, she says she can no longer afford it. She was laid off in August, which I didn't know about until after she signed. She since got a new job. Um from what she told me about three weeks later. She said that she's even making more money. She told me on the third, when our brought the rent, or when, when they brought the rent over, I assume that's supposed to mean, I told her she's still legally responsible for the apartment. Um, I'm at a loss. I offered to lower her rent for two months to help her get back on her feet. She declined. Do I ask her to be out at the end of the month and tell her I will buy out her lease with the last month in security deposit? I started advertising right away and so far, no response on the inquiries. So this, is a, this isn't worded the best, but I think I get the general gist of what's going on here. Uh, essentially, you have a tenant, you just put this tenant into a unit, they've lost their job or whatever the reason is, they're coming to you and saying, hey, I'm not gonna be able to afford this apartment. Um, she says she lost her job, she got a new job, the new job pays more, whatever it is, I don't really understand all of the, what's going on there. But essentially the tenant has come to you and said, hey, I'm not gonna be able to afford this apartment. So I think you're doing the right things here. Um, the tenant's coming to you with a concern that they're not gonna be able to pay the rent uh, and you basically are left with a couple of options. You can ignore the problem, tell the tenant to figure it out and you're going to wind up with a messy situation and likely an eviction. So your other option is work with the tenant and find a solution that works for everybody's benefit. Get the tenant that can't pay out, get a new tenant in place that can pay. You already have the unit listed for rent, which is good. Um, that's actually a requirement here in the state of New York that you try to mitigate the, the damages wherever possible. You have the unit listed for rent. You're already working to help the tenant find a new place. That's a good move on your part. Um, You've also let her know that she's responsible for the rent. You didn't mention the utilities, but I would definitely make sure she's aware of that as well, that she is responsible until a new tenant is placed, which she is contractually obligated to. You're correct in stating that. Um, we also include in our lease a fee that the tenant is required to pay when they notify us that they're no longer going to be able to stay when they're looking to break their lease. We charge them a fee to help cover the cost of the marketing, the showings. I mean, when we were a property management company, we bill our client, the property owner, when we place a new tenant. If that tenant subsequently doesn't perform, they're gonna wind up having to pay that same fee that the property owner would have to pay because we have to go through that entire process all over again. So our lease includes that fee. It's very clear as to what the fee is and when the fee comes into play and things like that so that the tenant understands what it is that they're going to be due. Um, let me see here, I'm just double checking my notes to make sure I covered everything. Oh, okay, yeah, this last month in security. It's great that you have last month's rent and security deposit here. We wouldn't be able to do that in New York any longer. But the nice thing is you have a little bit of, a little bit of cash on hand to kind of offset some risk here. So, you know, if the tenant decides I'm just not gonna pay that fee um, for placing a new tenant, or I'm just not gonna pay my utilities, or I'm not gonna pay the rent or whatever, at least you have a security deposit and a last month of rent that you can draw against to pay those, those fees. So that's good news for you. Um, it's good that you had that set up. I'm glad that you have that because it might come into play here in a little bit. Um, but realistically speaking, you're going in the right direction. You are trying to find a new tenant for the space. You've talked to the existing tenant and let them know, hey, you're still responsible until we find a new tenant. But after that, you know, then once a new tenant is in place, we can release you from your obligation. It's you could just stick it to the tenant. Like, of course that's an option, but 
it's really to no one's benefit in this instance. Um, it's going to cost the tenant some cash, the, the current tenant. It's going to cost the current tenant some cash to get out of the situation, and they're going to learn some lessons, but at least they're not stuck in a unit that they can't afford for the next 11 months. Um, you, there's no benefit to sticking it to the tenant here. Your best bet is to try to work with the current tenant to get a new tenant, get the new tenant in there, and move forward from the situation. But trying to stick it to the current tenant is not to anyone's benefit here. Uh, and you're, you're better off just finding a resolution to the situation that keeps everyone as happy as possible. I mean, there's going to be people that are going to lose a little bit of cash on this. You might lose a little bit of cash as a landlord. You're doing what you can to try to prevent it. The current tenant might lose a little cash in the process. You're trying to do what you can to save them money by helping them find a new tenant. You know, it's not a win-win for anybody necessarily, but I think that there is a solution here that gets the current tenant out of the unit and gets a new tenant into the unit. On to our last question of the day, record keeping and data hoarding. After your tenants have left your property free and clear of any damages owed, what documents do you still keep on file? So this is an interesting one because in the world of digital, I probably keep a lot more than I need to. I'm what you would call a data hoarder. I literally have some emails from probably 2014, 2015. I hardly ever delete anything like that. Um, so when it comes to tenant files, I keep a lot of tenant files. You know, it's digital. It's not like it's taking up physical space in my office. So I keep their lease. I keep their any addendum um, or any renewals to the lease any violation letters, any rental application and uh, move-in documentation, especially move-in and move-out photos and move-in and move-out condition sheets, those are huge. Um, I keep a copy of their tenant ledger. I keep a copy of their security deposit disposition letter. Basically everything. Like, I don't really feel a need to discard much of anything as long as I can move it into a digital format. Um, it's very seldom that I ever need the data, to be fair. It's not like I'm going back into the records of a tenant that moved out five years ago all that frequently to look for something. But every once in a while, we do have a need for that data, um, especially things like move in, move out photos. Obviously, move in, move out photos are great for doing your security deposit disposition, but they're also great for, hey, what did this used to look like back in 2014? And then being able to go back in your history, okay, here's the tenant that lived here during that time, here was their move in photos, here was their move out photos, oh, this used to be a different refrigerator. We replaced this refrigerator, whatever, whatever the case may be. It's nice to be able to have some data to go back and look at so that you can see how things have changed over time. Um, so for that, recommend, or for that reason, I recommend as much data as you can hold on to digitally, hold on to it digitally. As far as the physical paperwork, hold on to it for whatever the statute requires you to hold on to it for and then get rid of it. Scan it, make it digital, put it in a file system and get rid of it. Um, as far as file system goes, the easiest file system you can set up um, as far as we're concerned, because we have multiple different you know, clients that we work for, but it's we do a folder for client, and then inside all of those folders is an individual folder for each property, inside those for each unit, and then inside of each unit for each tenant. So it's kind of a file, uh, you know, a system hierarchy, a directory tree hierarchy, if you will, but it helps us stay very organized and find things very, very quickly. So that would be my recommendation. Um, but yeah, I'm absolutely a data hoarder. I see no reason to delete something that's digital unless I absolutely have to for some reason. I just keep all that stuff because I like having it for reference down the road in case I ever do need it. So that pretty much wraps things up for this week's episode of Ask a Property Manager. Thank you all so much for watching. We love producing Ask a Property Manager and you can definitely help us to improve. Do us a favor and drop a question in the comments either here on Facebook or on YouTube. Your question may be answered in an upcoming episode. If you enjoyed this content or if I brought some value to your day, do me a favor and hit that thumbs up button. YouTube and Facebook both push videos based on community feedback. So every like, comment, subscribe, and share helps us to grow and reach more people. We'll be back next week on October 20th. That's next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Eastern with another show you won't want to miss. Thank you all so much for watching and we'll see you next week.